welcome back to Life After Neverland. My name is Corinne, and today's Bible study that we are going to be covering is Israel and the Church by Amir Sarfati. And I feel like today is a wonderful day to uh, discuss Israel, simply because it's such a hot topic, number one. And number two, I really want you guys to know some history, the truth about what really is going on in Israel, because there sure is a lot of deception and delusion in the minds of many people um, globally. And so we're going to do a little history lesson in just a couple minutes um, to keep your mind fresh on truth. Uh, but before we do that, everyone, I just wanted to say, uh, please hit that notification bell if you do enjoy this channel and you want to stick around because I do want to communicate with you if anything in my life kind of turns upside down or shifts a little bit so that way you know when I'll be posting. Um, unfortunately, one of my beautiful cats that I had for 17 years, her name is Peach, she actually did pass away um, this past weekend. Uh, we tried our hardest to keep her vibrant and healthy, um, but her body just wasn't cooperating in the end. And so I did want to say thank you to those of you that sent your condolences. Ruth, if you're watching, Pam, Chris, and Michelle, thank you so very much. Barbara as well, you guys uh, really warmed my heart. My animals are basically my, my, my life. <laughs> I love them. I have a bit of a pet rescue here. In fact, one of my friends, she she went to an auction where they take goats and cows and alpacas and even zebras and many different exotic type animals and they send them to slaughter or for sacrifice or uh, for sport in all honesty. And so she got me a goat, a baby goat. <laughs> so uh, we're raising him right now and, and that is definitely licking a lot of our wounds which was um, is really sweet. In fact, the goat was was uh, nurturing actually to Peach uh, for the last couple of days that we were able to be graced with her presence, thanks to the Lord. I, I feel like he gave us an opportunity to give her a good send off um, and give her extra, extra love. Um, and so what a blessing, right? Because sometimes we don't get those opportunities. Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and get started with our study. Before we do, again, I want to give you a little history lesson by Amir himself. Can Gaza ever see peace? We hear much about Gaza today, but pro-Palestinians never mention the thousands of years of its history. Upon the conquest of the land of Canaan, Gaza is mentioned as one of the cities of the tribe of Judah but also as part of the rest of the land that the people of Israel did not dispossess. Since the days of King David, while Gaza was being destroyed and rebuilt again and again, there was always a consistent Jewish presence there. From the Roman era, the Byzantine period, the Arab Muslim rule, the Mamluks reign, all the way to the Ottoman Empire, you would be able to find Jews living and praying in Gaza. Gaza's Arab population grew gradually during the modern era as migrants sought opportunities. The area lingered between Israeli and Egyptian control until it was finally handed to the Palestinian Authority in 1994. The winds of peace blew through Gaza with the Oslo Accords. Huge funds poured in for years in the hope of building the new Singapore of the Middle East. But did peace reach Gaza as a result? Not at all. Instead, Gaza turned into a hub of violence and terror. As Abba even once said, the Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. His words are still relevant today. Shortly after Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005, Hamas took over. In a short time, Christians nearly vanished, Jews nearby faced rockets, and non-compliant Muslims perished under Hamas's radical rule. Here's a question to think about. Have you considered that maybe the violence in Gaza is the result of a rejection of God's clear instruction that the land belongs to His people? With other solutions failed, maybe the answer is not no Jews in Gaza, but more. The Bible mentions the following about King Solomon. 
for he had dominion over all the regions of this side of the river, from Tifsach even to Gaza, namely over all the kings of this side of the river. And he had peace on every side all around him. Peace is the opposite of what we've seen in Gaza. It's time to think outside the box, because going along with the two-state solution has brought disaster to Gaza. Bring peace to Gaza by listening to God instead of listening to men. And just to add to that, I think it's so valuable for us to keep our head in the Bible because it is the truth and it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, don't you find it absolutely amazing to know what happens at the end of the Bible and that those prophecies have not yet been fulfilled, but yet they're fulfilling themselves right before our eyes? I know I say that quite often, but my heart of hearts tells me that the Lord and, and the Bible itself tells me that I think we're closer than we realize to the Lord's return. And I think there's no time like the present for us to draw in towards him, draw nearer towards him, ask him to come into your heart. Let him know that you understand that you're not perfect, you're not worthy, and repent of the things that you've done and ask him to change your life. Ask him to make you anew. And also be gentle on yourself and realize that that's not going to happen overnight, but that he will work on you and he will assist you and you'll start to see the changes. I have seen them in my own self. Our human selves, I think, sometimes tend to want things to be fixed like that and see a miracle happen in one day. So please be graceful um, to yourself while the Lord is graceful with you. And then understand that he came down wrapped in flesh, died on the cross for your sins so that you could live in eternity with him and that the Lord raised him from the dead. And once you can admit all of that, say that out loud with your mouth and feel it in your heart, you are saved, you are saved. And so welcome to this channel if you're new. I'm so grateful for you being here and those of you that continue to support this channel, I cannot say thank you enough. You guys have been a huge blessing. All right, so before we get started, what was I gonna say? Oh. The books, we have books available. Amir Sarfati's ministry has provided books for you, as well as Revealing Revelation, which was the prior Bible study that we covered. And so if you are just starting Revealing Revelation or you would like to start Revealing Revelation and you need a book, and we've got the study guide to go along with it, we'll be happy to send you the book. And then when you're ready to start Israel in the Church, or if you would like a book because you're just now starting Israel in the Church, please let me know. <laughs> I have my address, my email address in the description section, and I would love, 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 love to send you a free book and study guide. All right, so today's lesson that we are going to discuss, we're on chapter two, is two trumpets are better than one, the shared purpose of Israel and the church. And so like I said in the past, this is basically something that I think we need to know in the end days, where the Lord stands in regards to Israel, what's happening with Israel right now, and the church, us, a believers, all right, the Gentiles. He tells us, he tells us what we need to know in the end times and what a beautiful gift and blessing that is. And so this is the week where I do my reading and then next week we'll work on the study guide. So questions that are intriguing and thought provoking in regards to the reading that we're going to do today. So if you have a book, it's even better because you can read along with me. Okay, and I, I tend to like that more. That's just me. Okay, all right, when I'm on the other side of things. The air was cooler now that the season had begun to change, but that didn't stop the sweat trickling down from where the man's son sat on his shoulders. He had lifted the boy to his perch to keep him from getting pulled away by the current of the crowd. Up on Dad's shoulders was also the only likely way his son would be able to see anything. This was the first time that the boy had been old enough to make the week-long journey to Jerusalem for the festival. It would have been a shame if his view of the event was limited to the dusty cloaks and grimy sandals that would have surrounded him. The temple courtyard continued to fill and the bodies pressed tighter and tighter together. A murmur rushed through the crowd and the eyes of father, son, and thousands of others looked up to the surrounding wall. Two Levites, spotlessly dressed in their ceremonial robes, had mounted the wall from opposite ends and were marching toward the meeting place at the center. 
Tucked under the right arm of each was a long silver trumpet. With each step, the reflective glare from the sun against the shiny metal bounced across the crowd, leaving hundreds trying to blink away blue spots. When the two trumpeters met, they turned away from the temple toward the surrounding city and the land beyond. As one, they slowly raised the instruments to their lips, inhaled deeply, then blew. The note from each trumpet merged with its counterpart into one resounding blare. Even from behind, the sound was piercing and the man felt his son's hands lift to cover his small ears. The Levite stopped and the sound echoed back from the Mount of Olives to the east. Then came a second blast, then a third. After the seventh blast, the Levites lowered their instruments and began their marches back to where they had begun. As they did, the people in the crowd lowered their heads in prayer. In his ear, the man heard his young son whisper, What now, father? Now there's a sacrifice. And then what? And then we go home. Wait, the boy said, sounding confused and disappointed. You mean that's it? Well, there will probably be some singing and dancing, but yes, that's it. There was silence for a minute while the man prepared his heart for the sacrifice that was about to be offered on the great bronze altar. But he could sense his son trying to process the information he had been given, and he couldn't help but anticipate the next question that he knew would come. Sure enough, the boy asked, if that's all there is, then why do we come? It hardly seems worth it. We come, the man replied, because God said to come. Now hush for the offering. Instruments with purpose. In the Bible, the one instrument you read about most is the trumpet. You may find a harp or a lyre here, maybe a cymbal or a tambourine there, but if you were a musician looking for job security, you would have wanted to start those trumpet lessons early. This is Twiggy. <laughs> Today, when people think of trumpets, they picture a series of brass tubes with three valves, with the mouthpiece at one end and a flared bell at the other. But most of the trumpets found in the Bible are more organic in nature. Typically, the Old Testament trumpet refers to a shofar, which is a hollowed out ram's horn. The tip of the horn is cut off to create a small hole for someone to, as the great actress Lauren Bacall said to Humphrey Bogart, put your lips together and blow. <laughs> One of the more cringeworthy moments I often experience when I'm leading tours of Israel is when people discover the shofars that are for sale in many of the gift shops. I will watch as a group gathers together. One man, typically it's men who do this, will pick up a ram's horn, bring it to their lips, then blow. The sound that comes out is usually reminiscent of the last sound the ram probably made before it lost its horns. Ah, oh my goodness, <laughs> jinx. But that is not the cringeworthy part. Having failed at his attempt to summon the army with the shofar, the first man will pass the horn to the next for his shot at group glory. <laughs> The horn will then be passed to the next, then the next. Then when everyone who wants a turn has had a turn, they will set the trumpet back down. There it will sit for a minute or two until the next group walks up, lifts the shofar, and begins passing it from one set of lips to the next. <laughs> I feel like I know what he's gonna say next. I'm getting a little squeamish just thinking about it. I imagine selling shofars will look very different in a post CV19 world. I don't think I would have wanted to do it even prior to, but that's okay. Anyone else? <laughs> Seriously, no. No, thank you. I don't know, maybe way back in the 70s when I was a little kid, and yeah, you just don't think about stuff like that when you're a kid. <laughs> okay, while the shofar is what is normally referred to by trumpet in the Bible, there's another kind of horn mentioned that is made of very different material. In Numbers 10, the people of Israel are camped in the wilderness of Sinai. God had given the law to Moses, and the people were getting anxious to move on. But to move that many people, the Lord knew that there would need to be some organization. So to help with crowd control, 
he gave Moses a task. Numbers 10, 1 through 10. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for calling the congregation and for directing the movement of the camps. When they blow both of them, all the congregation shall gather before you at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. But if they blow only one, then the leaders, the heads of the divisions of Israel shall gather to you. When you sound the advance, the camps that lie on the east side shall then begin their journey. When you sound the advance the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall begin their journey. They shall sound the call for them to begin their journeys. And when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow, but not sound the advance. The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow the trumpets, and these shall be to you as an ordinance forever throughout your generations. When you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, and you will be remembered before the Lord your God, and you will be saved from your enemies. Also in the day of your gladness, in your appointed feasts, and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings, and offer the sacrifices of your peace offerings and they shall be memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord, your God. Two trumpets were to be crafted from pure silver. Rather than looking like what you might find today in a school marching band, these would more closely resemble heraldry trumpets. They were likely long and straight with a gradual flare at the end. Picture in your mind a medieval king returning home to his kingdom. The trumpeteers would stand on top of the castle walls and blast out the sound of their sovereign's arrival on their long, brightly polished horns. These are the type of trumpets that God commanded Moses to make. Not ones to play a song, but ones to serve a more practical purpose. The immediate reasons for creating these instruments are spelled out in Numbers 10-2. They were for calling the congregation and for directing the movement of the camps. Depending on whether it was one trumpet sounding or two, or the trumpeteers were playing in unison or in a harmony, or they gave one long blast or a certain series of notes, the people could discern whether God was calling in meeting or telling them that it was time to start moving down the road. There was also a specific cadence that served as an alarm, letting the Israelites know that an enemy was approaching. These were real trumpets serving a real world purpose for God's people. However, that doesn't preclude them from also being something more. A shadow of something greater. Occasionally in the Bible, God will introduce a person or event or item that we will later discover has more significance than we originally anticipated. These are sometimes called types or representations or shadows. We definitely talked about those in the past, in our past studies. Actually, we even talked about it in the final Nephilim most recently. The shadows, the types. In my previous book, the day approaching, I presented the Old Testament feasts as shadow celebrations representing greater future events. I love how just bits and pieces of each of these studies kind of complement each other, even though they're different in so many ways. Passover found its fulfillment in the crucifixion of Christ. The feast of unleavened bread was satisfied in the perfect sinless life of the bread of life, Jesus Christ. The feast of first fruits was a shadow of the resurrection of our Lord, whom Paul describes as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Fascinates me. That's in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, indicating that we too will one day rise up in like manner from the grave. The feast of weeks remembered over Pentecost 
was expressed when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church. The Feast of Trumpets is finding current fulfillment in the signs all around us announcing the soon coming of our Lord. The Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles or booths are still awaiting their realities when respectively all Israel comes to Christ and when the church and all who follow the Lord will dwell together with him in the millennial kingdom. For each of these events, something lesser is established that will find its greater counterpart in the future. These are instances in scripture when people are types or representations of something to come. The prophet Malachi recorded the words of the Lord of hosts. Malachi 4, 5 through 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Ooh, my goodness. <laughs> Before the Messiah is revealed and the day of the Lord comes, Elijah will return. Because of the promise from God, a representative chair is set out for the prophet at every Sadar meal. Jews will tell you that it is impossible for Jesus to be the promised Messiah because that chair is still empty. Elijah is still missing. No Elijah, no Messiah. But Elijah has returned, and the Jewish people missed him. When the disciples were questioning Jesus about this very subject, Jesus responded. Matthew 17, 11 through 13. Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. <laughs> so exciting. I don't know, some of these things I'm just learning for the first time. Jesus tells the disciples that the Elijah the Jews should have been waiting for was not a literal Elijah, but a type, a representation. While the Old Testament Elijah proclaimed the coming of God for judgment, the New Testament Elijah, John the Baptist, proclaimed the coming of God for salvation. There are also times when God will use things as shadows or types. This is the case for the two silver trumpets. Yes, they were actual trumpets that served a practical purpose, but they also represented something much greater. To discover this alternate identity, let's first look at their purpose. A trumpet blast was primarily sounded to direct people's attention. If they heard the sound of a horn echoing through the city, they would stop what they were doing and listen. They knew that trumpets weren't sounded frivolously. If someone was blowing one or more horns, there had to be a reason. Second, the trumpets sounded to call a gathering of people. In Numbers 10:3, the Lord says, when they blow both of them, all the congregation shall gather before you at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. When the horns sounded a specific cadence, the people left what they were doing and made their way to the tabernacle. Third, these trumpets could be sounded to announce the arrival of a dignitary. Again, like the heralds of old. Finally, the trumpets could be blown to direct the people either in warfare or during a journey. One series of notes meant attack, another meant shift right, another meant retreat to safety. A call to attention, to gather together, to announce someone's coming or to direct the people. Each one of these purposes can be linked to future events. The sounding of trumpets at the rapture when Jesus returns to gather his church and take it to be with him, and the second coming, the remarkable day when he steps foot again on the Mount of Olives with the church in tow in order to establish his kingdom on earth, contain elements of all four of the purposes 
four, trumpets. But two of the above stated purposes are more evident in these events than the others. Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica about that wonderful moment when we will be taken up to meet Jesus in the clouds. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. At the rapture, Jesus will descend, the archangel will let out a holler, and a trumpet will echo through the heavens. When Jesus returns the second time, this journey lasting all the way down to ground level, the trumpet will once more be heard, only this time it will sound throughout the earth. Jesus said, Matthew 24, 29 through 31, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. The heavenly trumpets will sound to announce the coming of our Lord at the rapture and at the second coming. They will also signal the coming together of his people. First, the church at the rapture will gather to Christ, then the saved Jews and any others who have come to Christ during the tribulation will congregate as Jesus returns to earth a second time with his bride, the church. Announcing and gathering these are the two key purposes of the trumpets. But what about the attention getting and directing functions? It is in these two roles that I see the specific typing of the two silver trumpets. A call to attention. We live in a very distracted and distracting world. <laughs> I hear that. Yes, I do. And I agree with that. <laughs> Work, family, entertainment. There are so many voices that are calling for our attention. But this is nothing new. People have always found reasons to focus on the day-to-day -day of life and ignore the big picture. This is one of Satan's great tools against us. As long as we are looking at ourselves, and our own busyness, our eyes are not on God. You guys, that's extremely, extremely, extremely obvious, extremely no duh, no brainer, but yet how do we get ourselves out from that entanglement? It's gonna take a lot of focus, it really does. I'm one of them that gets entangled into all of that. Every now and then, news will come out of California of a highway accident involving dozens of vehicles. The cause is not snow or ice. These incidents take place on days when the Central Valley Thule fog is at its worst. The Thule, from which this fog derives its name, is a marsh reed that is prevalent in that region. When the conditions are just right, a thick, opaque, airborne moisture rises from these marshes and settles in, a joy for the fruit farmers, but a nightmare for motorists. Most drivers know to slow way down on foggy days, but there always seem to be those who feel they have x-ray vision that enables them to see through the white blanket. All it takes is one of these reckless road warriors to collide with the rear end of a car that suddenly appears in the cloud in front of them for a chain reaction accident to start. The drivers behind them will not be expecting cars to be stopped on the road, so they'll plow into the bad driver's back end. Then the next car will hit, then the next, then the next. Suddenly there's no way to warn the oncoming cars and trucks about the danger that lies just ahead. Warning is the job of the trumpets. 
to blow the signal to get the attention of those who can't see or who are too distracted to notice the peril that is just up the road. It is to wake them up from their ignorance and apathy. God has created his trumpets to tell the world, stop, wake up and turn around before it's too late. But what, you may be wondering, do these trumpets look like to us today? How can you recognize them or hear their sound? To understand this, there is something that you must first realize. These trumpets are not a what, but a who. God's first trumpet, Israel. There are two witnesses that God has called to get the attention of the world's population and point everyone to himself. The first of these testifiers is Israel, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. The Lord looked over all time and all people, and he decided that this one nation would be singled out from all the others. God didn't choose them because he was lonely and wanted companionship, nor was his desire to create a spiritually elite nation that could lord their God relationship over everyone else. Instead, his decision to make Israel his chosen people was as much about benefiting the rest of the world as it was about that one singled out nation. When God made his covenant with Abraham, we see his blessings directed both within Israel and without. Genesis 12, one through three. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed and so I just want to add my two cents here before I move on um, right now what we're facing is the the fact of a two-state solution which does not benefit Israel at all it basically leaves them in harm's way when that's exactly what they're trying to protect themselves from is living in fear and in harm for their entire existence I feel like our country is, is very quickly cursing Israel. And he says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. Keep your eyes on Israel, everybody. God's promise was that Abraham's descendants, Israel, would be blessed by him and that he would in turn bless the rest of the world through Israel. What did this blessing look like? First, it is from Israel the salvation would come to mankind. Listen to me, you stubborn hearted, who are far from righteous. I bring my righteousness near. It shall not be far off. My salvation shall not linger. And I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. When the Savior finally arrived on the scene, he came from Israel. Jesus was a Jew who dealt primarily with other Jews during his three-year ministry. And it was in Jerusalem that he was sacrificed, paying the price for our sins and opening the door for our salvation. If you're looking for the people and the place of salvation, both are found in the nation of Israel. And so don't you find it interesting that as we are living in the end times, this little country the size of New Jersey is under so much attack including their people, and that's where our Savior is from and originates and died on the cross. I mean, do you really think it's a coincidence? I don't, not at all. It is also through Israel that God first offered his written word. From the detailed historical accounts to the beauty of the poetic books to the practical truths of the wisdom collections to the hope and warnings found within the prophets. Humanity owes a debt of gratitude 
to the Jewish people for being the communicators of God's message to his creation. Israel was given the responsibility to be a witness for God, to direct the world to the Father. Through how they lived and worshiped and obeyed and loved, they were to be the living representations of the Creator on this earth. But instead of embodying this wonderful purpose, Israel infamously crashed and burned. The people sinned, rebelled, and ran away from their Lord who had blessed them so wonderfully. God's second trumpet, the church. Enter God's second trumpet, the church. Just before Jesus ascended to heaven, he told the disciples, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judah and Samaria and to the end of the earth. In the same way that Israel was meant to be God's witness to the world, he then passed his role on to the church. It is now from the church that the world hears about the truth of salvation through Jesus Christ. And it is from the church that the second collection of writings, the New Testament, was added to God's word. Israel and the church are the only two groups of people whom God calls his witnesses. While both were called to be the Lord's trumpets, the ways they sounded out have been different. Israel had much more of a passive testimony. The people demonstrated God simply by being. As they lived generation to generation, God was able to show who he was, his love, power, forgiveness, grace, mercy, and judgment. All his character and attributes were at some point demonstrated in his interactions with the nation. There were certainly some occasions when Israel was commanded to overtly preach God's message to the nations, such as God's call for Jonah to warn Nineveh that his judgment was coming. Jonah had other plans and hopped a ship headed to the opposite direction. One storm and a big fish uber later, <laughs> Jonah was walking through the Assyrian capital, smelling of stale seafood and warning the citizens to repent. But for the most part, Israel was called to be the living testimony of God. One only need go back to the mandate that Jesus gave to the disciples prior to his ascension to see how different the church's calling was. The fledging group of believers was to serve as witnesses to the ends of the earth. This charge is clearly stated in Matthew's account of the Great Commission when Jesus told the disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. While Israel was called to be, the church was told to go. Not only are the methodologies of the witnesses different, so are the primary messages of Israel and the church Israel announced the existence of God. The nation provided opportunities for God to demonstrate his character. It is through Israel that we see God is faithful, all-knowing, all-powerful, and everywhere present. The message of the church is more. Okay, now that you know who this God is, here's your heads up that he's on his way. These messages are not mutually exclusive. There's plenty of God is coming, so you better get right with him now in the Old Testament. And there's no shortage of here's who our wonderful Lord is found in the new. But before you warn people that someone is coming, you need to let them know who that someone is. A deeper look. When God told Moses to build two silver trumpets, he was creating a type, a shadow, of a bigger reality. Israel and the church were going to be his witnesses to wake up the people of the world to the reality of who God is and to warn them of his coming. Now that we know the purpose of the trumpets, let's take a deeper look at the details of these instruments. First, notice that there are only two. God could have made three 
or five or seven or 20. Instead, he just called for two. In the Bible, this is a number of union. There are two testaments that make up one Bible. The commandments written on two tablets comprise one law. During creation, after declaring everything to be good, God came to Adam. In a world of twos, two cows, two zebras, two elephants, there was only one. One. <laughs> one. <laughs> God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So a quick nap and one rib removal later, the one had been made too. And here is where God's brilliance comes into full display. Now that the one was two, God instituted a plan for the two to again become one. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. This union is also found with the two trumpets. The two sound the testimony of the same God. Both find their origin in Abraham. Israel finds its physical origin in him and the church its spiritual origin. And like Adam and Eve, these two will one day be made one. However, unlike what many believe, this union has not yet occurred. The union of Israel and the church will not come until there is a new heaven and a new earth, when there is no more need for a sun and moon and stars for light, because God will be our light. We will deal with the current distinction between Israel and the church much more in the chapters ahead. A second fact to consider about these trumpets is the material they are made of. Why are they made of silver? If they are so important and precious to God, why would he not make them out of gold? It's because silver better defines who we are. Silver is precious, but it is not the perfection of gold. Israel and the church are both very precious to God, but they are not perfect. And just like silver cannot make itself gold, Israel and the church cannot make themselves perfect. That is something that only God can do. I'm going to read that again um, because I had talked before about how um, works-based religions are very confusing. The Lord died on the cross for us. He did it for us. So just like silver cannot make itself gold, Israel and the church cannot make themselves perfect. That is something that only God can do. That's why you want to ask him in your heart. You want to ask him to make you anew. You still won't be perfect, but you will be saved. Okay? And you'll have eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. This is true also. Enzo agrees. Don't you, Enzo? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> the UPS guy just got here. <laughs> so, you know, everything falls apart whenever the UPS guy comes. Okay, let's regroup. This is true also for many who walk through the doorways of churches every week. We just got all kinds of animals coming and saying hello today. This is Coda. Remember she came by last time? Didn't you, Coda? Did you come by last time? No shortage of love in this household. They are trying to prove themselves to God through serving or giving or making sure their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds. Again, this never works. As Peter made clear when he said, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name that includes our own. What a great point. This goes along with what I was saying. The Lord did it all. The final part of the trumpet that bears discussion is the mouthpiece. A trumpet will not sound by itself no matter how fine the craftsmanship, no matter how precious the metal, unless air is passed through the mouthpiece of a trumpet. It is no better than a heavy, expensive doorstop. The lips that press against these two silver trumpets are God's 
It is his breath that passes through and sounds the beautiful notes. Israel and the church can do nothing on their own. They are just the vessels. It is only when the breath of God passes through them that they will play as he wants them to play. How sad is it to hear Jews and Christians boast of their identities as if in themselves they are something special. Our meaning and purpose and reason for existence is only found outside of ourselves in the person of Jesus Christ. God's breath doesn't just give the trumpets voice. It gives them life. How has Israel survived over the millennia? Through the persecution and pogrom, expulsion and genocide, nation after nation and leader after leader has sought to destroy that which God has created. Keep that in your mind, people. The same was true for the church through most of its existence and still is today in many parts of the world. Yet the Spirit of God, His breath, passing through these trumpets has sustained them. Where can we find the breath of God? When we trust Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, we don't just receive salvation, but also the Holy Spirit. He is the gift given to all who believe. Do you know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? I pause for a second because to me, it's very profound um, being that I'm learning a lot of these things for the very first time, but it's just very profound to me to think of all the things that the Lord did dying on the cross alone and how much I think um, I fear, I guess, or I observe it where it just tends to be um, overlooked or not spoken about in depth. He died on the cross for our sins, but then we received so much more. Um, and here we're discussing about how we received the Holy Spirit, which is a, a massive gift, gift to our life. And then in, in the final Nephilim, I, we were talking about another gift where he separated after his death, after his resurrection, um, all of the believers were separated in like a holding place. You know, there were Hades and Abraham's bosom, but then after his resurrection, when he goes down and he ministers to the people in hell, he was able to take uh, people like Lazarus, remember Lazarus and the rich man? We talked about that in the final Nephilim. These people, um, the believers, were on the other side where the unbelievers, like they could see them, but there was a chasm there. They weren't together, but they could see each other. Well, when the Lord rose from the dead, he also made it so that the, the believers now, they couldn't before, they have access to heaven. So that also, there's a lot, there's layers, and it's really cool. Yeah, okay, where was I? So did you know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? The spirit is the breath of God that sustains our souls, even when our bodies fail. There's another source where we can find that life-supporting witness-giving breath. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. It is in the Bible that we find God's exaltation. His words were sounded through his instruments and written down for us to hear any time that we desire. What a beautiful gift. Sadly, the reason so many churches are sounding foul notes is because they have strayed from the Bible to a feel-good, emotion-based theology. How can someone searching for the one true God find him in a church where the Bible is mentioned only once or twice in a sermon, and even then only to back up a point that the pastor had already predetermined to make. The same is true of us as individuals. Unless we spend time each day filling ourselves with the Bible, the breath of God, we will never be able to sound the alarm to this world, nor will we be able to accurately represent who the Lord truly is. And I can tell you right now, 
um, through these Bible studies. They've been so extremely helpful to me, and that's why I find it in my heart that I want to share it with the rest of you, not only to hold myself accountable, but hopefully I'll reach someone who was where I was, where I didn't really know anything. You know, I just, I believed that God existed, and that was the extent of it. I was grateful to him for the part that he played in my life. That was the extent of it. I wasn't searching for him. I wasn't hungering for him, not in the way that I should be, or I could be, if that makes any sense. And the more that I search for him, the more that I try to learn more about him, it really is, is a feel good. It, it feels really good. And it's not, I'm not talking about emotion based, I'm talking about soul based. I, I need his guidance in my life and when I seek him, and make the decisions with him at the forefront of, of my decisions, I feel better about my decisions and, and the choices that I make in my life. Okay, um, but definitely not perfect. Definitely fall on my face every now and again, And but it's good to have the Lord to turn to when you need to regroup. <laughs> um, anyways, I digress again. What sound are you making? So we're gonna be wrapping up here, guys. Uh, stick with me here. This is the soul part, I believe. I mean, it's pretty good at finishing up with some soul for words. Okay. If Israel and the church are the two trumpets, then only since 1948 have both trumpets sounded together. Until that point, there was only one playing at a time. In the Old Testament, Israel sounded God's fanfare. Since Pentecost, God has pressed his lips against the mouthpiece of the church. But when Israel again became a nation in 1948, suddenly the two trumpets united in a sonorous, if still imperfect, sound. Israel is once again demonstrating the power and character of the Lord by its very existence and by amazing revitalization of the land. A key phrase repeated throughout the book of Ezekiel is, then they will know that I am the Lord. When you read Ezekiel 36 through 37, then look at the nation of Israel today. It is very evident that the Lord of all is alive and well and working in the world. Amen. Meanwhile, the church is continuing in its mandate to spread the gospel throughout the world. Two trumpets, separate, but still sounding together their unique divine tunes. This is where our challenge comes in. Paul asks the question, if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? What kind of sound are you making? When your neighbor or coworker or family member speaks with you, are they hearing the song of the Lord or just more worldly noise? And there's a lot of worldly noise and it's loud. We are to be the watchmen from Ezekiel 3, 16 through 21. We are called to alert the lost about who God is and what is about to happen. The only way we can make sure that our sound is loud and our notes are true is to be daily in the word of God and in prayer. This will allow the spirit of God to fill our minds and his breath to fill our lungs. That is when all those around us will hear the trumpets of God in all we say and do. And so that finalizes our chapter reading for today. Again, I wanna say thank you so much for your time and your commitment to this channel. Please let me know that you stopped by by saying hello in the comments section down below. If you like this reading and you're getting a lot out of it, I, I can tell you that this, this is a great book. I really, really love it. And of course, you know, our last book, Revealing Revelation, was amazing as well. I felt like I learned so much about the Lord. And of course, I still have so much more to learn, and I'd love for you to continue to join me moving forward as I will continue with more Bible studies as we wrap both of these up, although we did just start them. So if you are interested in any of my other Bible studies, please make sure to look for the playlists for Revealing Revelation as well as the final Nephilim. In the meantime, you guys, I hope you have a blessed rest of your week. I'll see you Monday for the final Nephilim, and I'll see you next week where we'll cover the study guide here for what we just read today and I'm anxious to get that started and I hope that you all are well. Thank you again and feel free to share with your friends if you'd like for them to join us so we can spread the word and use our trumpets uh, but if there's anything else that you feel that you see online of course I think if your heart tells you to share it with others maybe some family members or friends 
do, do, do your due diligence and be brave and, and share it with someone that you love and care about. Okay, much love to you all. And again, thank you for your time. I'll see you next week.